and welcome to another episode of A Catholic and a Protestant Walk Into a Bar. I'm Elijah, and I'm a Protestant. And I'm Nathaniel, and I'm a Catholic. And today we're going to be talking about a subject that is very important, and um, it affects all of us. Uh, We're going to be talking about defending life for the most vulnerable. That means the unborn. So the subjects that we're talking about today are really complicated. Um... And honestly, really tough to talk about. And we've we've been talking about it amongst ourselves and just trying to figure out how exactly do we do we go about this subject? How do we handle it well? Um, and I'm not entirely sure. I don't think we are, but we're going to try. You know, abortion has is something that's been around, or or population control is what it's commonly called, nefariously called, I might add. Um, In the ancient times, population control or killing off of the children wasn't done in the womb. It was done once they were born. Uh, In Rome and Greece, they would just leave their kids out to die. And this happens actually all over the world still, and mostly in um, a lot of times in Asia and some parts of Africa, though I don't think it's as common there. Um, The Christians in in the early centuries would actually find the children that had been left out exposed to die and they would take care of them and they would you know care for the children that were unwanted which ties into the whole Christian duty of caring for orphans and widows and in this case you know, specifically for the orphan right I mean even in the book of James um, James says you know the true religion is this is caring for the widow and the orphan and that's what Christianity is that's in the early years that was our distinctive we actually we actually cared about our fellow man we didn't just serve ourselves um, and it's been a Christian distinctive to promote a culture of life mm-hmm. um, you know if we go historically here there's a document that was discovered. Um, called the Didache, or some people might pronounce it the Didache. Um, it, it's after the way of the Twelve, um, the Twelve Apostles. <laughs> um, yeah. um, but it's a small, very concise, very succinct liturgical manual that tells you about the t- Christian teaching of life, gives a small little discourse on baptism in the Eucharist, and that's about it. But just quoting here the Didache uh, in chapter 1, there are two ways, one of life and one of death, but a great difference between the two ways. And then it goes on, you know, giving, you know, things of, you know, you shall love the God who made you, love your neighbor as yourself, etc. Pretty standard stuff. But you go to the second chapter of the Didache, and it goes into this legalistic list of sins. It's like, oh my gosh, you Christians believe that there's wrongdoing? Yeah, it's almost like they're imitating Paul or something. Right. And so in the Didache here, um, again, it's not canonical, it's not biblical, but it gives us a very good idea what the first Christians were thinking Um the second commandment of the teaching, that is the way of life, um, you should not commit murder. You should not commit adultery. You should not commit pedastry. You should not commit fornication. You should not steal. You should not project, practice magic. You should not practice witchcraft. And the biggie here that really ties in with our episode, you should not murder a child by abortion or kill that which is begotten. So you can't kill a child in the womb. And if the child is born, you can't just throw it out on the street. Mm-hmm. And finally, in this... Thing. It has stuff about coveting, swearing, bearing false witness, speaking evil, not bearing grudges, so on and so forth. But we see here in this document from the first century that Christians were against abortion and were against killing the young and the vulnerable unborn. Yeah, so this isn't anything new. This is what Christians have been doing for 2,000 years. We have been trying our best to protect life. And sometimes, you know, we we failed. You can, church history is replete of Christians and people calling themselves Christians doing terrible, awful, stupid, evil things. And every time we've done that, we've tarnished the image of Christ. And that's the, the ultimate evil, to throw mud and muck and trod Christ underfoot again. But currently, our culture... Our Western world has been pushing abortion and pushing the slaughter of innocent babies in the womb, and they call it pro-choice, just another term to mask dismembering and sucking out the, the 
dismembered parts of a child from a, a mother's womb, which is one of the many ways you can have an abortion. That's usually done at a later term. Typically, they try to give you a poison that kills the baby, and then you... It's a forced miscarriage is what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, currently, it's this argument is one of the biggest ones in America, and it's affecting places all over the world. And currently, Ireland is in this big discussion on whether or not they should legalize abortion or keep it illegal um, by, say, by removing the Eighth Amendment or keeping it. And I'll go on. I'll talk about that later on. First, we kind of want to get through some of the objections to speaking out against abortion. So objections to abortion. Uh, a lot of people will say that, you know, yes, abortion is always kind of bad. I mean, you're killing a child. But, you know, and then they'll, again, use euphemisms like pro-choice um, to make it seem less bad that, you know, a, a child is being killed. And so if you say anything about, you know, a woman should keep her child, whether it's through, you know, the child is conceived through rape or something bad, they'll just be like, oh, that's horrible. Oh, my gosh, that's so barbaric of you. How could you say this? Um, well, I mean, I think we should uh, be honest here and uh, lay down the law a little bit. Um, Christians do have to draw lines in the sand sometime. Um, you know, in Joshua, um, it is said, you know, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Um, I think also of John Paul II, who made those legalistic, quote unquote, binaries, um, when he said that, you know, there's a culture of life, there's a culture of death. And well, the church, hopefully, you know, God willing, is promoting the culture of life. Um, and you have to choose between those, um, a cultural life or a culture of death, and you have to be consistent. Um, and the thing is, there are some in the church um, who have put out this device of rhetoric called the seamless garment theory. Um, especially in Catholic circles, mm -hmm. this was put out by a guy named Colonel Bernadine. Um, he was the uh, Archbishop uh, of Chicago and obviously a member, member of the College of Cardinals at the time. He's, of course, since passed. But he definitely put the seamless garment a theory out there, and it's been kind of an American Catholicism ever since. Um, just the idea that, you know, abortions, oh, it's bad, man. I mean, babies die, and you know what? You know, the Catholic Church is a little con uh, obsessed with contraceptives, too. That's, that's you know, contraceptives, yeah, I guess that's bad, too. I guess Paul VI said so. Um, so, yeah, that's bad. But you know what's equally bad? You know, hunger and, you know, feeding the naked and the homeless and clothing them and making sure they're taken care of. And, you know, income inequality, that's bad, too. And, you know, we just need to be very consistent about the quality of life um, and just, you know, we need to focus on these things as well as abortion and contraception and stuff like that. And, you know, at first blush... It sounds really nice, doesn't it? I mean, it's just like, yeah, I want to be against all these things. I want to be on the line, you know, being consistent, and I want to be, you know, found, you know, fighting against the world in all these areas in a way. Yeah, that sounds great. But the thing is, the seamless garment theory isn't completely Catholic, which isn't to say we can't contemplate something like it, but again— in historical Christianity and in, with the Bible itself, you know, there are binaries and there's times to draw lines in the sand. So think again of Joshua, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And to think this again. This day whom you will serve. Yeah. And also think of, you know, John Paul II, you know, culture of life and culture of death. There's only one or the other. Are you going to live or are you going to die? You know, I think in Deuteronomy it says, you know, today I put for you life and death. Choose life then. And, you know, and that's what God says in Deuteronomy. So there is life and death and we have to choose between those. Mm -hmm. And there's also the difference in kind. Like it would be wonderful again if we could focus on everything equally. Maybe that would be wonderful. It, it actually wouldn't. But there are some things that are way more important than others. It is more important to save someone's life than to feed that person. Not that you can't also feed that person. But say you were going to focus on you, you, 
you want us to be as focused on abortion as we are on feeding people in soup kitchens or the murder rates in the inner city as we are with feeding the people in the inner city. The most important part of that actually would be keeping that person alive and then feeding them. So keeping them alive is the most important. Feeding them comes second. There's a difference in kind. We are emphasizing the idea of being uh, uh, for the we are talking about abortion so much and so often as a church and as Christians because the culture is trying to push on the culture of death. It is trying to kill our children in the womb and it's trying to kill the elderly before they can even die in their proper time, which is a subject for another day. Right. I mean, even to tie in with that, um, I know um, very there in the beginning with uh, Pope Francis's pontificate, he was very big on what he called the throwaway culture, and especially with euthanasia and the elderly. Um, just the fact that we throw everything away in our culture. You know, we buy a can of Coke at the gas station, and then we drink it and we throw it away. We do the same thing with human beings. We do it with our children and the um, you know, if we've had sex at, at uh, uh, what we would see as an inconvenient time and, you know, a child is conceived of that, we have an abortion. We throw that child away. You know, we took care of our parents or rather our parents took care of us. And then, you know, they get old and again, inconvenient and they, you know, need care at a nursing home. But you know what? We just really don't need them anymore. And so we're going to pull the plug on them. And It's a culture of death. It's a throwaway culture. We don't value things. We don't try to fix things anymore. We just try to throw them away and get something new or something that won't cause us as much uh, uh, inconvenience. It's disgusting. And what about this whole thing uh, being called pro-choice and Christians saying that, oh, well, I'm I'm against abortion, but personally I'm pro-choice. Or even people saying that I'm against abortion, but... I'm only personally pro-life. Publicly, I'm pro-choice. I want to say that if you're a Christian and that you think you think this, then it has to change. You cannot hold to the gospel of Christ, which tells us to that tells us that the real religion is to care for the fatherless and orphans, and then say you're okay with woman killing their children in the womb. And one of the reasons why people bring this up is they say, well, we want to keep women safe. We don't want them to be harmed if they're in a risk pregnancy. We want them to be able to abort the child and there's other concerns that are involved. And to some of those concerns, I would say it's like sometimes muggers get hurt by the people they're attacking. Do we want to create a safe space, a safe space or a safe time, like a little time zone, say 5.30 p.m. in Chicago, where muggers can safely attack innocents and they are not allowed to defend themselves? It would reduce the problem. It would reduce the problem with muggers getting hurt by the people that they're mugging, but it would still be mugging. You would still be committing a crime regardless of whether or not you created a safe time for it to happen. Exactly. And, you know, the catechism of the Catholic Church is pretty clear on these type of issues. There's not a lot of gray area. Um, So I'll just draw our attention to paragraph 2270 of the catechism. It says, Human life must be respected and protected absolutely from the moment of conception. From the first moment of his existence, a human being must be recognized as having the rights of a person, among which is the inviolable right of every innocent being to life. And then in the same paragraph, it goes to two Bible verses. Um, One is mostly Jeremiah, and the other is from the Psalms. The first one, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately wrought in the depths of the earth. And how can you depart from that? What, what gray area is there? And so even the church, when she deals with people who have committed abortions, she is merciful, but abortion is a grave sin. It isn't just stealing a cookie out of grandma's cookie jar and you can, you know, walk about your day. It's Mm -hmm. killing a human being. And so again, we, if we move on uh, a little bit further in the catechism, um, in paragraph 2,272, um, the catechism says a person who procures a completed abortion and cures excommunication, latte sententiae, 
which means by the very commission of the offense, and is subject to the conditions provided by canon law. Why does the church do this? Well, the church, it says, does not thereby intend to restrict the scope of mercy, which is to excommunicate people by doing that, but rather she makes clear the gravity of the crime committed, the irreparable harm done to the innocent who is put to death, as well to the parents and the whole of society. So it doesn't do to be, oh, I'm, I'm pro-life personally in my heart, but outwardly when I walk about the world... I'm pro-choice because, you know, there should be a separation of church and state. Like no, some Catholic politicians. Yeah, we won't name who those are, but there are Catholic politicians who are definitely thinking that way, and that is their rhetoric. But mm. no, it's just like if you are a Catholic and a, or a Christian, um, you know, whatever don, denomination, if you are a Christian, you need to be living your faith in every sphere of where you are, at work, at home, wherever you are, out and about at Walmart, it doesn't matter. And abortion is, and let's use strong language is a non-negotiable. Close the book on that one. Oh, all right. And, you know, another objection is that, or one of the things that people bring up when you're talking about being pro-life or being pro-choice, which is actually being pro-abortion, because that's the only thing you're talking about usually when you're talking about being pro-choice. They bring up the issue of rape, incest, and then a danger to the woman, maybe a woman, uh, if she's not, if the baby isn't taken, then the woman will die, or you know, vice versa. Um, and to that I say that there are two crimes, the two worst crimes that humanity can commit is murder and rape. Rape dismantles the person at their most intimate level and murder dismantles the entire person, destroys the entire person. If you are a victim of rape and you become pregnant, that is what was done to you is unthinkable and evil. The worst evil that a person could have done to you outside of straight murdering you. However, that baby even though it was born of the seed of an evil, despicable human being, that child is precious. And you cannot justify trying to fix the crime and evil of rape with the worst crime of murder. Right. And, you know, I think a lot of people, they will hear that rhetoric and they'll hear, you know, what... Christians believe, and they will say, but but you want our baby so bad in that womb, and it's like, but why won't you adopt it? You you know, why won't you adopt our, those children, and why won't you do that? And the thing is, I think Christians should be adopting. Mm-hmm. It's expensive, but we should be adopting, and I, I, absolutely. And a lot of adoption or pregnancy care centers uh, offer adoption services. They they connect you with people who want to adopt the child the child. Yeah. And the thing is, if you look at history, um, you know, religious orders, you know, especially religious sisters, were infamous for having orphanages. And their very job was to rear, you know, the unwanted children of society and make them, you know, presentable to where, you know, people will come and adopt these children. That was their job. Again, like James said, you know, true religion is this, is caring for the widow and the orphan. We cared for orphans. That's what we did. And we still do, but why don't we go back to what we've done and what works? And why can't we, why can't it be that the icon for an orphanage is a cross or the church? Why can't it be when I say orphanage, you think of Jesus and you think of the church? Because that's how it used to be. And that's the way it needs to still be, I believe. Um, Because for most of Western history, it was only the Christians that were doing this. And I believe, you know, I, yeah, let's be exclusive. This needs to be a Christian trademark again. And so if you're planning a family, definitely try your best to, you know, have your own biological child. And even if you can or can't, you know, pray on it and see what needs to happen and how your finances are. But try to at least adopt one child if you can, if you're able to do it. Mm -hmm. Because that is a testament to the Christian vocation of, you know, taking people in um, and taking care of them. And after all, 
all that uh, Christians are are adopted sons of God through Jesus Christ. <laughs> you go to yeah. the first chapter of John, that's exactly what we are. We're adopted sons of God through Christ. And yeah, an adoption is something that my wife and I plan on doing. Once we're done having our own children, we plan on adopting more because we believe that adoption should be a Christian distinctive from whatever denomination, whatever tradition, Catholic, Protestant, Calvinist, Orthodox, that adoption is incredibly important. <clears throat> and when people bring up the, the dangers that some women face when it comes to being pregnant and when their, their life is at risk, from for various reasons, maybe they had an accident, and either they can save the mother, or they can, and they can only save the mother. And the only way to do that is by performing a surgery or performing a procedure that will kill the child. That, for for one, that's one of the that's the rarest cause of of um, abortion. Most people abort their child because they don't want them, or they can't they. They can't afford them or they're pressured to do it. And, you know, I can't think of specific examples, but there have been many cases um, where maybe a, a, a Christian mother who has been terminally ill with maybe cancer or just had had struggles with childbirth before. The doctor tells them, if you have this baby, you will die. But you know what the Christian mother does? The Christian mother goes and had, ha- goes ahead and has the baby. And sometimes, yes, the mother does die. But the Christian mother realized, I've lived life. I have, you know, my vocation for God is complete in my motherhood. And that I, you know, no greater love have a man than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. How much more for your own children? Now, we don't want to make it uh, sound like we're unsympathetic to the plight of the people experiencing this. Because that is a terrible, terrible decision. But I think the—I I, I do— firmly believe the Christian way to go about this is to do everything you can to save both the baby and the mother. And depending on the situation, choosing which one to save. And it's it's an awful, awful, terrible choice. And one that my heart goes out to everyone who has to make that decision or, or who faces that struggle. But it is such a statistical minority of abortion that are performed and such a statistical minority of situations where this even happens that it is irrelevant to the conversation of whether or not abortion should be legal or illegal. And, you know, I can remember when I took a health class in university, it said in the textbook, and I rolled my eyes and I wanted to throw the book against the wall, it said verbatim, it is safer to have an abortion than to carry a child to full term. And I want to say what a load of malarkey and how sick is that such propaganda floats around to form people's opinions to think that abortion is always the better way than to carry someone's child to full term. Mm -hmm. It's disgusting. It is. And beyond abortion being just the murder of children, to say that you're pro-choice and you're a Christian or to make one of those arguments, you need to understand a few things. Abortion targets... Minorities in America to such a degree that in 2013, there were more black babies that were aborted in New York City than were born to the tune of roughly 5,000. 5,000 more babies were killed in the womb than were born. And that was from PolitiFact, by the way. So it's not a, it's not a right-wing or pro-life site. And the Guttmacher Institute says that for every 1,000 women, 27.1 abortions are performed. For Hispanics, of every 1,000 women, 18.1 abortions are performed. For non-Hispanic, it's 16.3. And for whites, it's 10. That means the rate for other groups almost doubles. If you want to say that you're pro-minority or if you want to say these things, then you have to be, you, you got to take this into account. Because you cannot say that you're pro-choice and then be totally okay with them slaughtering minority populations to the tune of 5,000 more in New York in 2013 than, than babies born. And also, a vast majority of abortions are done against women. They did a study with babies born 
our third children born, out of every, for every 100 females, 150 males were born. And this is, you know, there's, there's a 50-50 chance for a boy and a girl. This is an incredible discrepancy. That means there had to have been influencing factors. It's not just random. That girls are constantly targeted for abortion. So abortion harms minorities and women more than it harms anything else. And if you want to be pro-woman and pro-minority and pro-immigrant and pro all these things that relate to uh, societal justice and things like that, then being pro-choice is one of the worst things you can do to help them. Advocating for abortion to be legal, to be done at any point, is the worst thing you can do. It kills more than almost anything else, and it destroys more lives. We cannot stand on the fence when it comes to this issue. It is an imperative that we are either a culture of life, like you were saying, Nathaniel, or a culture of death. Please, we need to choose life. We cannot hide behind false arguments or false statistics or lies pushed by Planned Parenthood that's funded $500 million every year from, by the U.S. Senate. We cannot do this. Throwing away the unborn in abortion is straight up diabolic, folks. It's of the devil. It's of Satan. It's of Lucifer. It's of hell. Um, there's no parsing words for this. It's evil. And there's a lot of spiritual warfare concerning this issue of abortion um, that we have to come out and talk about. Um, The devil wants babies to die in the womb. The devil does not want them to live. He does not want them to become Christians and join the army of the Lord. He wants dead babies. He wants dead people. He doesn't want sons of God. He wants sons of perdition. We have to fight that with everything we are. Planned Parenthood may not be the only abortion provider, but you better believe that in the United States of America, Planned Parenthood is the largest abortion provider. And Planned Parenthood is pretty much everywhere in this country. Um, And it will affect uh, your local area, um, especially if your area has minorities in it, Um, especially if you live in an urban area. Um, you know, um, allowing an abortion clinic in your city will only perpetuate crime and murder and vice and things of the devil and sin because it is a capital sin. It is a mortal sin. Um, and worshiping this sin and this act of death, (laughs) you're going to get a culture of death. So you can't be a Christian and think Planned Parenthood is okay. Can we come out and say that? Let's say that. Yeah, um, yeah. I you, think that's I think that's really safe to say. Um, you you may read stories in the news about um, you know such and such uh, a clergy person, a clergyman went to this abortion clinic and blessed it and had a little prayer service and you know was for social justice and empowering women. Well, that's evil. Evil. That's not Christianity. That's a false religion. Um, so yeah, let's just put that out there. Um, So when we think about our local area, let's just, I'm going to tell you a story. I've been, you know, working on the south side of Springfield, Missouri. Um, That's where we live um, in the Ozarks area for Mm -hmm. a while now. Um, um, Whether it's been, you know, making sandwiches or being at the hospital or being at the plasma center I'm at. Um, I've been working on the south side. And, well, the Planned Parenthood The Planned Parenthood location in Springfield is on the south side, and I've driven by it. And every time I drive by it, more often than not, I will not even say anything. I will just sign my body with the sign of the Lord's cross, the sign of his redemption of salvation. And I will pray for, in this silent manner, the people that work in here in this center of death for the souls that have lost, been lost to the Planned Parenthood organization in general. And then I just pray that God would get rid of this organization from our town Mm -hmm. because it's just so weird that, you know, we live in Springfield, Missouri and it's like, like as Elijah has said in other times, Springfield is like the buckle of the Bible belt. It is the place where, you know, it's supposed to be the Christian 
uh, you know, evangelical, <laughs> yeah, evangelical Mecca, Vatican, whatever. It's it's like the evangelical Baptist just hub of everything you would expect from you know low church Protestantism. And yeah, I mean, we've got the Assemblies of God here. We've got I think Oklahoma houses the the Baptists. We, everything just kind of centers in this part of America. We have more churches on corners here than we have basically anything else except for restaurants. And the restaurants are built for the churches. Yeah, it goes hand in hand. And, uh, you know, it's not uncommon. Like walking downtown, you'll have bullhorn preachers and trying people handing out tracts and trying to, you know, quote unquote, make sure people are saved or say the sinner's prayer and, you know, ensure that they might see Jesus one day in heaven, which is all fine and dandy. But we do all this work and, you know, the buckle of the Bible belt and guess what? Planned Parenthood still exists and has an audience and has a clientele. Mm -hmm. How good of a job is the church doing in Southern Missouri if that's the case? Um, We need to be vigilant, repent, and fight the good fight. This isn't acceptable. Um, And so do remember the unborn in your prayers and do remember those who are victimized uh, by people who... um, destroy the unborn. Um, so the people that work for them, the people who are uh, lured in by their tactics and propaganda, you must pray for them and you must work them into your daily routine. So when you pray, pray for them. And if you fast, fast for them and offer up your sacrifices for this cause. Because again, culture of life and culture of death, what side are you on? And just a side note for something for Christians in the Ozarks area to pray for. Um, Planned Parenthood hasn't had an actual abortion in this area since 2005. As of September 2017, they have been going through the court system in Missouri, and eventually they want to appeal to the Supreme Court to get um, at least medical abortions in Springfield. That means taking an abortion pill. Um, As it is right now in Missouri... uh, Only, uh, I believe, uh, Kansas City and St. Louis have abortions right now. I think uh, both Columbia and Springfield right now, they kind of serve as satellite locations where they can refer uh, girls and women for abortions um, to other providers. And they can uh, basically peddle the culture of death by promoting promiscuous sex with contraceptives and so on and just promoting the culture of death. So definitely keep Springfield in your prayers. I don't want to see uh, abortions resume in this town again, but um, the enemy, uh, meaning Satan, is railing against this town and wanting abortion to be back in the city full swing. Mm -hmm. So just keep that in your prayers. I would like to direct our attention now to Ireland. On May 25th, Ireland will vote on whether to keep or to repeal the Eighth Amendment of the Constitution. The amendment reads, The state acknowledges the right to life of the unborn, and, with due regard to the equal right to the life of the mother, guarantees in its laws to respect, and, as far as is practicable, by its laws to defend and vindicate that right. The Eighth Amendment is the only thing standing between the unborn and abortion in Ireland. Many in the fight to keep the amendment are focusing on the message to love both. They're emphasizing care and compassion for expectant mothers and the unborn child in the womb as well to create a societal structure that will support both. And I would like to play a small segment of a video from the campaign Save the Eighth. Servitude, the word used to sanitize the enslavement and forced labor of black people in the 1800s. The final solution, the phrase coined by the Nazi party to cover up the Holocaust and their plan to torture and exterminate all of the Jews of Europe. Segregation, the expression used to mask the racism and discrimination against African Americans in the 1940s. Repeal, the word currently being used in Ireland to avoid addressing the ugly truth of abortion. It kills a baby. Words matter. They can be used to save life or to end life. I encourage you all to watch the entire video, which will be linked to down below. I'll also link to the Save the Eighth website and to the Love Both Project website. 
If you live in the U.S. or you're just not in Ireland, there's always a temptation to not see someone else's plight or someone in another country's plight as seriously as we see our own. But the fight for life matters. The unborn of every single nation matter. They matter just as much in Ireland as they do in the United States, as they do in China, as they do in Africa. And it's our job as Christians, as people who are pro-life at every stage, to encourage those that are in that fight. And while the push to legalize abortion is strong, the fight to keep the eighth and to vote no is unwavering. The pro-life Irish need our prayers and our encouragement in their fight. So as the 25th of May draws near, let's continue in prayer and pray that life is upheld in Jesus' name. (sighs) This has been a tough episode um, because this is a tough subject. And, Um, you know, we're sorry if if you think we're coming across too harsh or too too dogmatic, but... It's a dogmatic <laughs> issue. It's, it's, it's either white or it's black. It's life or it's death. And uh, there's no nuancing the actual Christian position on abortion and the unborn. So if we've shouted into the microphone, we're sorry. We love you. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're here to talk and to listen, whatever the case or your opinion about abortion may be, as long as you're willing to be civil um, and to have that dialogue. But just know that this is our position and we can't move from it. Um, we will definitely listen to you and talk to you, but it is what it is. Yeah. And if you're someone who's listening who's had an abortion, this doesn't mean that we hate you or you're a terrible, evil human being, even though we believe that what you did was wrong. But there is still forgiveness at the foot of the cross of Christ. It is not an unforgivable sin. And it's not a reason for you not to, not to come to Christ. And, you know, we don't condemn those who have sinned and repented. That's right. Our benediction, this episode will come from the words of Jesus Christ himself. Um, We'll go from Matthew chapter 18 verses three through five, and then we'll go to Matthew chapter 19. Um, Here's from Matthew chapter 18. Amen, I say to you, unless you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever, therefore, shall humble himself as this little child, he is the greater in the kingdom of heaven. And he that shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. And simply from Matthew chapter 19, verse 14, Jesus said to them, Suffer the little children. And forbid them not to come to me, for the kingdom of heaven is for such. Amen. Amen. And I'm Elijah, and I'm a Protestant. And I'm Nathaniel, I'm a Catholic. Thank you for listening to this episode of A Catholic and Protestant Walk Into a Bar. Next time, our subject matter is probably going to be a little bit lighter than this. But there's no going around it this time. All right. All right, until next time. Bye.